Everybody enjoying the conference so far? Yeah. Learning stuff? Yeah. Well, for, for this, I was, I was thinking it's, it's always nice to go to a conference and see and learn about other features and what other people have done with OpenMS. Um, and that. But I was also thinking, you know, sometimes it's just kind of nice to be able to talk about OpenMS in terms of, of operations as, hey, I'm using it, I'm having a problem, where would I go to look for information for, for it? Um, how would I go about debugging a problem I'm having? Or say there's a collector isn't working or or a polar isn't working, or notifications aren't working. You know, where where do I go to to look at the log files, or what other tools are available to help you know somebody go through OpenMS and, and figure some of that stuff out? Um, so I put together a couple little slides of just some some of the top things that come. To my mind as I was looking at this and then we can I was hoping that people would have questions and we can just have an open discussion after that going over the various components and stuff uh, you know, if, if you have questions on how you would go about solving a problem that you might be having with with open MS and where to go look for, for things with it right now um, so I thought that there was really two areas of work that you go through with with OpenMS. There's the there's logs, and there's a lot of logs on the on the system, and there's also a few of the command line utilities and stuff that are available to that you can use to go back through and actually exercise the same code that OpenMS itself is using for for doing its tests and stuff. Um, with logs, OpenMS uses Log4j, and it's split into three separate directories, and each of those have different uh, files for various components of OpenMS. The automatic rotation is also based on um, date and size. Actually, not just size right now. Um, I know there's a there is a Apache extras. Uh, jar file like for log4j that you could put out there to do file based rotation based on date. I've not had a chance to look at that much. Um, I worked last year at Dev Jam on integrating log4j. Uh, they made the decision to switch from, from log4j or other methods of doing logging, and they've, they've decided that they wanted to use SLF4J for doing all the logging across all of the components of OpenMS. One of the other decisions that was made with that, too, is that all of your logs are now going to be in one single directory, so they'll all be in one location instead of being split across the couple, across the three directories. The... Uh, that work isn't fully finished yet because there's a lot of stuff that ends up going to to a uncategorized log, which is kind of the the, the catch-all one that's out there. Currently, with 112, these were the top logs that I, I as far as if it, if you don't know where to look, look in one of these. Um, I put the manager log up there because. I like to see how OpenMS is doing when it's starting up. So if you're having a problem starting up OpenMS and it's throwing an error in there, if you switch over and go to, uh, if you turn debug on for the manager, it's going to actually start to display a few more bits of information as it goes through and starts up the various components. So you'll see that it's starting up the yeah, event D, it's starting up collect D, it's starting up polar D, it's starting up, and then at the, the final end it'll say that it's starting 
the Jetty server, and then you can see when it says it's done, it's finished, and, and everything's up and running. Standard out is direct. Standard out and standard error are directed to output.log. Um, one of the things that I find annoying with this kind of thinking where I redirect all of that stuff is that it makes it kind of hard to rotate output log on any kind of size or, or, or that. Um, you can inside your openms.conf file that the OpenMS uh, shell script reads set up something so that it's going to rotate the file on on each run. But then you know if you do that, then when you go to stop OpenMS, it creates it rotates the file and puts puts it out there. That would be a, a feature enhancement that I would would kind of like to see is some way of having all of the standard output actually control directly through. The, the logging system instead of it being something that's that's kept separately. The standards.log and uncategorized.log I've generally seen that they contain mostly the same log lines. Um, it, they seem to uh, um, uncategorized is the one where any any thread that's logging a message if it hasn't already been set up with a specific category is going to end up in there. Uh, so for example some of the things you may see is if you're doing a polar for web client and stuff the those uh, the Apache HTTP client messages might end up show at a trace level would show up in the on categories dot log instead instead of in say the polar dot log. But those those are the good place to start for getting through to some of the information. Um, for the UI component of OpenMS, we've got the three logs: the Jetty log, the Web dot log, and Web map dot log. Jetty log contains pretty much everything from Jetty when it's going through its startup and telling you where and what it what it's doing for um, web dot log is where all of the main processing of any of the web pages and stuff is supposed to be showing messages in there but something is broke inside openMS and what ends up happening is all of your web UI requests and, and all of that information ends up actually going out into the, to the web map dash log um, and but uh, and those are all controlled by log4j too, so you can go through the log4j.conf file and adjust what uh, what values and stuff you want to see from from there. Um, going back to the main daemons, then that open us runs. We've got these various ones: event DB and anything going on in the event bus. There'll be log messages and stuff will go to event log. Provision D and its discovery and scanning and stuff was going to put messages into provision D.log. Um, polar has everything in the polar.log. Notifications go in the notif D.log. Collect, collection, data collection in the collect D.log. The QD.log and instrumentation.log are other log files that are used that come through from your data collection. The QD.log is where RRD is the JRobin or RRD tool are going to be having some of their messages on when it's recording information on, on how things are going. I by default QD isn't going to show you a whole lot of information unless you turn the logging to debug, and then it will print out it very every so often how many uh, some information about how it's been processing or the writes that it's been doing for 
did our reviews and stuff. So it'll tell you, you know, there were 500 new metrics that it had to collect and, and that it was writing out. And, and there's other ones there. Um, if there's uh, another one that it'll show is it'll tell you how many how many pending operations are sitting in memory waiting to be fed out to disk. Um, and that's an example there of if you're having performance problems with your disk I.O. on your system, you'll see that typically will end up creeping up over time and, and won't, you know, it will never actually flush all of those pending operations and, and you'll never see that go down to zero. Um, so that's something where Eric's talk on, on newts is pretty exciting for me because I've had significant issues with my OpenMS server not being able to collect and store and persist all of the metrics that's been stored or that, that we've collected. We would see our OpenMS server start up and I would see roughly 30 to 40,000 pending operations that would be sitting in memory and you know, given time it would it would escalate up further or would, you know, I, I would see things over over a hundred thousand pending operations and I'd see things come back down based off uh, after the aggregation points would, would go through. Uh, one interesting thing that they did add in, in a more recent release was the instrumentation log. Um, the What's interesting for me in that is that if you were doing your data collection or polling and, and that, um, the polar actually stores your your latency operations of how long it took to do a poll and that for for the services that you're monitoring. When you're talking about data collection, that can actually scale up to, to a point where it's that's a whole lot of information that would that would really overload your, your underlying metric system with too much information so they've uh, added various points into some of the collectors to actually log additional information out to instrumentation.log so you could actually see where it's going through some of the steps of your data collection so it'll, it'll say in there hey i'm starting to do my SNMP data collection here and now I'm done with the the collection of all the data and now I'm starting to actually persist that data out to disk and then at the end of that it'll say I'm done persisting all of that data out to disk. Um, in the admin interface there's actually a, a link for the instrumentation log reader and when you click on that it'll give you a nice pretty good pretty page of, of all of the the nodes and stuff that have been doing the data collection and stuff and so you can sort of get a, an idea from there of how your nodes are performing for for the data collection that's going on. Some of the tools that exist on the system out there, the JRobin Inspector is, is a command that lets you go in and look at your individual uh, JRobin data files. The, it's, it doesn't do pretty graphs like everything inside OpenMS does. However, you can go in and actually look at the individual values, the, the metric values that were recorded coming through from the system at the, during the, the collection period time and uh, I, I found that to be pretty useful just as far as uh, wondering well what's what kind of a value is, is being recorded back here or wanting to drill down and, and, and see some things. The uh, system report is, is just a generic report that gets that you can print out and use for recording everything that's going on with the, the system. SMP request will actually 
test your remote system using the SNMP for G libraries, which is what OpenMS is using for talking to the system. So it's uh, instead of using the net SNMP tools to do the connections and using that separate C library stuff, this actually lets you use the same code that OpenMS does. And the idea being that if that is working there, then you'd be able, then we could say, well, it's what, why is things, why are things different between them? The config tester is a useful tool for testing your changes before you actually start up OpenMS. Um, there's uh, two flags that you can, if you run it without any arguments, it will display a list of all command line options that are available. The two that I use the most with it is the dash A and a dash V. The dash A tells it that I want, want to have it test all of the configuration files that are available on the system. And the dash V is just to tell it, hey, be a little bit more verbose and show me everything that it's going through as it's doing that. When, when it's doing the test, it's not a full-blown validation across all of the files. It's purely just a matter of, hey, will OpenMS be able to marshal and take the, in, take the XML file and read it in in a way that it understands everything that's in there. So if there were parsing problems or something like that with the file, the config tester would, would check some of those. Um, yeah. So what is the system on the output? What kind of uh, to uh, another text file or what kind of output? Is that the system on the top? Uh, I believe it's just a, a text file that it, it that it will put out for you. I know it's in the directory. I've, I've, it's, it's been a while since, I, since I've run it. I, I, um, then I just had a couple other tools that were available from other packages and stuff that you might see installed on the system. Uh, XML Lint will actually, you can use that for testing each of the individual files to make sure that they are well formed XML. SNMP walk, SNMP bulk walk, and SNMP table are methods of being able to get SNMP queries through through the systems and stuff. Um, SNMP table is kind of an interesting one. I hadn't really uh, learned about that tool for a while, but what it will actually do is instead of at, with bulk walk and walk, it would show you uh, the display of the OID on the on one side and it will show you the data value on the left side. SNMP table will actually take a table if you give it one, it will display it in a, uh, a spreadsheet like where it'll have columns and rows based on your indexes and stuff. Um, and then there's a, a couple other scripts that they've got out there. There's a uh, SNMP walk debug, uh, and what that one will do is walk most of the main tables that OpenMS wants to to walk as far as doing your configure uh, for discovering the MLD stuff. Uh, so that'll walk the the system table. It'll walk the the IF table. It'll walk uh, IP adder table. So you basically have a way of gathering debug information. If you found a problem and wanted to open a, a, either a support issue with the dot-com folks or, or found an issue and you wanted to post something out to the mailing list or had an issue with, with a particular data collection that was, was configured and you want to open up a, a JIRA issue to say, hey, I found a bug here, you know, here's some output to include in there. The SNMP walk scrub will 
you can pass the output from some of your SNMP walks through that, and it would actually remove IP addresses so, so that any of your internal IP addresses or external public addresses, if you didn't want those types of data information leak to happen out to you from mm -hmm. your mailing list and stuff. That's pretty much it for what I've got for for doing some uh, as far as the slides and stuff go. Um, but So I guess I, I will open up to questions right now of what people want to, they have questions or things that they want to figure out. How would I go about solving the problem? For example, we had a, uh, an issue where one of our routes had something like 4,000 mm -hmm. uh, Essentially, it was timing out. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm actually well done for now. Um, would would the SNMP um, check within uh, the bin directory? Would that have helped in debugging that? Because it, essentially we ended up looking through all the stack traces uh, and, and trying to figure that out. Would, would there have been? Is there a, an easy way to see, for example, what class B is? Is seeing or how it's uh, error in, in, in that particular instance. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you would have been able to see stuff in collectd log. Yeah, um, yeah. But that's essentially where we found it after yeah, all yeah. the stack trace and everything. After that, oh, does that mean it's timing out? Ah, right. That, that's um, you know, uh, but that did take a while to come around to. Um, yeah, that's that's where. I suppose the instrumentation log reader would have helped a bit there too, in that you would have been able to go in and uh, and look at things. So for the manager, you know, I'll go through, and this is where I'll change the um, an example of like change the the, the main level to, to debug because I was like, okay, I, I need more information. I just want to see more things that are going on with it. And that's where you know, so for example, see I get to see a whole bunch of things like this here where it tells me you know, where things are happening and stuff. Um, And then to your question on um, checking things, um, you know, it's going to show you the instrumentation log, log reader, or instrumentation log shows you when things are happening. So data, or, so you would be able to see that it was it was starting the collection, and it would tell you then when when it was was finishing it. So. Yeah, so we got the start of one here, and then down by the cursor is where it ended up finishing. Um, and you can go back through some of that too and look at the, the times of, if you match things up, correlate them all with the, the thread that's, that the collection was happening on. So, we categorized, showing me an example of a, uh, at least at the start here, there's a web request was made for a graph, and uh, a, it was asking for a particular attribute, but that attribute didn't exist. So, uh, I had 
written for some of uh, so an example of where you might see something like this is if you were to create a, an external dashboard of all of the graphs and stuff that might show up for a particular set of servers and stuff. So if you had, if you had something that was more automated where things might be generated on demand in, in that, you may create a, a PHP page or, or something like that that would actually reference a graph that may reference attributes, resources that don't exist on the system, and then that would end up showing up in your, your log like this. Um, but it's, it is something where it's, it would be nicer to see all of these messages inside the either the jetty.log or the web.log, but uh, you know, this is a good example of something where because Jetty is creating its own thread pool to use for all of the you know, requests that come in. OpenMS itself doesn't have direct control over where those those threads get mapped as far as uh, logging stuff goes. Another example of uh, the VPD XML extension I was talking about. I've got it uh, looking at a pattern and it's not matching something that it should be. Standards pretty much doing the same thing. Just you know, it's these are good examples of something where where data is being duplicated between a couple different locations and, uh, and doesn't need to be going that way. Um, Note if D is a, a useful bit of information because you can actually go back through it um, with as it's going through its its check of all of your notification when a when a notification is being, when it, the event is generated to cause a notification. Um, so with uh, notify turn to debug, it'll print out you know, all these things saying, hey, I've got my one particular UAI, and now I'm walking through all the available notifications out there saying, do any of them match on, you know, and when it does find something that it matches, you know, then it'll actually go through and say, well, is there, is there anything more, is there more data there that's uh, available for it? Um, and this, this was one where um, it will print out every so often a list of all of the pending notifications that are, that it will be sending out. So if, if you have, uh, if there was an outage or something and notification didn't happen or you wanted to go back and figure out well when did that originally start why didn't it come through or why did it come through then because I thought I had already disabled it well if you, if you have notice the on debug you'll actually get that information down to to that level where it'll, where it'll print that Um, any of them that are controlled by the log4j will, I believe the default is 100 meg and 4. Um, I got a little problem with that because uh, I had to change, or I changed that on my systems because, you know, my data collections, you know, Basically, I can carry about an hour 
in a 250 rank file. So with the, at the level of logging that I've, that it's going on right now. So um, you know, it's I end up uh, losing a whole lot of time. My log file can use a lot less than a minute. Uh, yeah, it's between logs. <laughs> yeah, it's like. I'm not, I'm losing a whole lot of information there just, and because, because it's 100 meg, if you change it to that, it's going to rotate so fast that, you know, you may come back 10 minutes later and be like, where's that log that I was looking at? It's gone already because it's already been, you know, the spewage of log has happened so fast. So, um, and this is also where, as you're, as you're looking at things, one, uh, you can also look use log4j to uh, go through and adjust things down. So, for example, even though I've got collect D by default set to do an info, I've gone through and I said for some of the various uh, uh, classes and stuff that I, I want to increase them back up to the one level so they don't spew extra stuff out into my log and that's one way of being able to 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 really quiet down the log to help you get a better idea of what stuff you just want to see so um, so I've got three lines that are you know I was looking at the SNMP collector at one point in time and wanted to to debug it to, to see what was going on. I've got XML collector in debug mode right here. So um, you know, I was wondering what, how it was doing. I've got uh, an entry for the uh, JMF collector. Also, the JSR160 is a, a variant of the JMX collector. And that's, as I'm running through those, that's something that I wanted to debug. And be able to watch and see as 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 those systems were going through. So it's really um, this is where as a as a more kind of think of myself more as a power user of OpenMS, um, and this is where I like having a checked out copy of the of the Git repository. Cause I, it, it just me, I, I like to be able to go back and look at the source code and say, well, why isn't something working? I've got the source code. I can go look at the source code and and examine it and say, well, what's what's it trying to do there? And and how do I how do I go through examining things there? Um, so the, and that helps at the same time because then as you look through the classes and stuff, you can look at them and say. Or are there particular classes that I want to to exclude from my list of, of logging? Um, you can also do that by changing the, the, the pattern to uh, so the, on the uncategorized there. There's the conversion pattern that that's the description of how it's going to to log everything out. So you got the the percent C being the class name that it's going to log telling you which which one's going on. Um, and then they got a couple other entries there up at the top showing some of the more verbose correcty ones that are that it uh, if you have those at debug it's a lot more information going out to your to your collective logs, but uh, I guess I like to. I had pretty much changed um, the logging for collecting Polar D to 250 meg and 20 files because I wanted them to to stick around quite a bit longer. However, that also does mean that my uh, twenty-nine gigawatt is is, is a bit uh, uh, have 
just sitting out there rotating every day through and stuff. Um, but on a normal server, we should not have the debug activated or something like that. Otherwise, we impact uh, the performance of the server having okay. all the logs that the debug. I, I didn't find that having it append messages to log files was that much of a performance hit on what I'm trying to do. I'm, you know, on my OpenMS system is 1800 nodes. Um, let's see how much. So, I'm going to get to that. So, I got 90,000 RIDs sitting out there. Yeah, and I am using store by group. So, there's a, there's a lot of collection and stuff going on. But, I mean, that's why I like the, the additional logging is on collect these going on. Um, it was one of those things for me I, I found. It's, it's a pretty common thing where you're having to go through. For me, I was having to go through and debug data collection issues or folder issues and stuff. And so I'm like, I'm just going to turn the logging off on those and, and try to, to weed out some of the stuff that is getting logged that seems to be pretty irrelevant to me. You haven't read the the wiki page on using uh, Git for your your configuration files. I would recommend that because then you know you can do something like uh, Git diff and it'll tell you all the all of your pending changes. If there was one thing that I would that I would like to see OpenMS add for the configuration is be nice to see them pull in the, the Java Git versions and be able to essentially version your, your configuration files. So anytime OpenMS goes and says, I'm going to write the file out to the file system, uh, hey, can you do that? You know, can you commit it to, to the Git, uh, your, your repository there? And then, so then you always have, if you ever needed to, back out a change. Uh, now it's very easy for you to sit there and you've got a history of, of things that have changed that and you could essentially back out to a, to a previous version of the configuration. So that's that's another useful thing that I find. Um, are you, you're probably not doing store by group? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, actually, no, that's very good point. Um, our RRD is a massive as well, that's the issue. We have whole, uh, five minute resolution for 13 months. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I then they wonder why it's like IO, IO, IO. Uh, hmm. And that was, I mean, just, uh, you know, speaking about IO for a bit, you know, how do you go through and troubleshoot some of, of that thing? You know, yeah, yeah. As, as Eric talked about in his news talk, um, just the pattern that RRD causes for going through and reading, reading everything, you either need to have a system with a ton of RAM so that it can basically cache everything that it's trying to, that it tries to read in, or, or you do need to make it something significant bigger up there. Um, We've got to put some uh, assigned for this essentially. Well, so, uh, that's but still, it's still it's problematic. Yeah, and, that, and that's kind of kind of a, a to so some degree, it's, it's almost a waste of money because you're having to throw so much money at it to to solve this one little problem that 
I mean, not, I would like to say the, the full resolution of those two points is probably much of itself, but if they had full resolution at once, mm -hmm. that's like 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. I have no idea that possible three times, but I, you know, it's probably hard to tell, isn't it? But, um, yeah. Do you, do you just have a single RRA then in, in, your, in your files, or do you have it? That, I mean, for, for us, we set up, uh, in, uh, I changed my data collection config. I went over to, um, I've got a, a five minute resolution that we store for 31 days, and then I aggregate all of those up into a one hour aggregation that we store for a year. And uh, I don't know that the min and max are, there's a lot of graphs that use those, but I don't, I wonder if they almost cause more headache than they were. Um, But yeah, so, for example, the, the MIB2 TCP GRB file for us is 3.3 uh, megabytes in size. Um, uh, ICMP is, is 8 megabytes in size. But I mean, I, I like having the, the granularity of that, that five minute down for the, the 31 days versus just having it for Seven Makes the graphs look a little bit nicer when you're looking at right, being able to, to look at some of them. I would generally find that uh, Postgres usually isn't an issue for any system. Um, the only time I found Postgres to really kind of get hit harder is if you're if you're using the, the syslog D service on it to import messages from syslog into OpenMS, um, and that's when it has to record when it's got to do all of those additional inserts into the database. Yeah. Um, other than than that, we, uh, our D strategy was. Really, the harder, hardest hit on the IO on the system for us. Um, the other thing with syslog was, uh, you know, Ken talked about syslog yesterday. Um, the you do kind of want to be a little concerned there as as far as the regular expressions that you use because. As OpenMS is parsing all of the message, your, your JVM's got to go through and build all of those regular expressions out. So there can be a little bit of a performance issue there to deal with um, as it's having to build up you know, the patterns and stuff. Any questions?